Good morning and thank you so much. What an amazing keynote address um, that we've just had and, and, and how inspiring to be able to start today's discussions on that note when um, one of the biggest issues that we have to tackle as Africa is employment um, and entrepreneurship and trade through entrepreneurship becomes one of our, our biggest opportunities, but also challenges in how we implement it. So thank you so much, um, Anne and to Regal Africa Group and all the partners for having us all today. Um, I'm going to kickstart um, the panel discussion this morning with um, some very able and very um, expert uh, opinion and thought leaders that are joining me on the panel this morning. So I am Yavi Madure. I'm the Executive Director of the Pan-African Business Women's Association, or as we like to call it, PABWA, which is a think tank for economic transformation focused on, on various initiatives and, and uh, projects that deliver for the women um, of, of Africa, the women of the continent, and the youth of the continent. Um, so trade is our, our center, it's our essence of, of how we look at economic transformation, and AFCFTA is our DNA, um, to, put it, uh, to put it mildly. So I just want to welcome um, the panel, the panelists for this morning's uh, discussion. We are stepping into the discussion called opportunities that the AFCFTA provides. Um, as I said, the AFCFTA is our is in our DNA. Um, so the people joining me on on this panel this morning are extremely knowledgeable. Um, have been navigating trade in Africa for many, many, many years. Uh, I won't give their age away, um, but what they'll be able to share with us today is insights and and understanding of what the opportunities are from an AFCFTA perspective, but more importantly, how do those opportunities become reality for the 1.3 billion Africans that Honorable Osiani was speaking about, and how do we make it real for the small businesses of this continent? So first up, I want to please ask um, my friend, the Executive Director of the AFCFTA Policy Network, Louis uh, your asshole. If you could please switch on your camera um, and just uh, say hi to everyone. I will call you all one, up, one at a time to be able to uh, make your introductions. Next up is uh, Laura Nalaika uh, from UNECA. If you could please just switch on your camera. And um, last but not least is Sand K. MBA Executive Director, Africa International Trade and Commerce Research. If you can please just all switch on your cameras. Um, uh, we're about to go into it where I'm going to ask you to please introduce yourself. There's Laura. Hi, Laura. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, uh, good it's morning, great everyone. to have you. Uh, good morning, everyone. As Siavi has mentioned, um, my name is Laura Naliaka. I'm a trade policy fellow at ECA, and I work uh, majorly on AFCFT issues. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much, and welcome. My friend, Louis, how are you? It's been a while, but it's so nice to see you. Welcome. We can't hear you, or is it just me? Can you hear me? Is it better now? Ah, uh, we can hear you now. There we go. <clears throat> all right, thank you. Uh, I say good morning to you, and uh, good morning to all our panelists and organizers. Uh, it's been a while, yes. It's been a while. We've been busy around Africa. Uh, yes, we've both been busy. <laughs> Please exactly. just introduce yourself, Lewis, and tell yes, us, Lewis um, the, you know, AFCFTA Policy Network. Yes, Lewis is uh, the executive director of uh, APN Group. APN Group is made up of the Policy Team Tank. Uh, being the first and the largest uh, NGO of uh, ASCFT and trade. We also have a subsidiary Women of Africa Network and the third one, Africa Globalized Investment. Uh, the investment is focused on organizing investment events throughout Africa, the rotational program. We just finished uh, the many one just about a week ago. So that's a bit I can say. Thank you. 
Good morning. Thank you, Lewis. That, that, that makes more sense. Um, good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us. So, um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is San Bakalu. I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces here. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of African International Trade and Commerce Research, which is an international trade consultancy firm for the African market. Um, basically, we work on four areas, four thematic areas, international trade, research, policy, and invest in African-related projects. We've been around from a, for a while. Uh, we operate from Nigeria, and um, we are so strong advocates of EFCFTA. And um, so thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, um, lady and gentlemen. Um, we're going to get straight into it so that we can start to get your opinion as I said to you all yesterday on the message. This is your, it's your panel. Um, you drive the narrative. Um, I am merely here to pull it all together. So I just want to kind of set the scene as we head into the discussion. Um, you know, we always talk about the opportunities that the AFCFTA brings. We are all um, advocates of it. Um, we are all, you know, very proud uh, uh, Africans when it comes to the AFCFTA, amongst other things. Um, and we, we create a particular narrative. But sometimes we don't necessarily understand, um, you know, policymakers. And when you're involved, even if, you know, organizations like us, and Sand and uh, Lara, Lara comes from e UNECA and Lewis, when you are on at the call face, um, we sometimes tend to lose the people who need the information the most because we're talking policy at policy level. So today I want us um, you know, to focus specifically on the opportunities of the AFCFTA, absolutely, um, but also how do those opportunities look in the real world? How does it feel, you know, to address designer, a freelancer, a consultant, um, a, a, an informal trader? What does it translate into when we say there are opportunities? What are those opportunities? How are they identifiable? Where would they find these opportunities as small businesses specifically, but obviously big business as well? but also how to make the AFCFTA work for them, not just from an opportunities perspective. Uh, opportunities are great, but unless it actually works for you, it's not necessarily an opportunity. You know, when we looked at um, some of the opportunities that we, 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 we generally speak about, all of us um, on this panel and others, is the single market that Africa creates. But what is so important about a single market? Single market allows us to be able to have access, um, you know, to be able to negotiate better terms, but to also to drive certain uh, benefits that it allows. And I'm going to let the panelists dig into the into the detail of that as we as we go through it. Um, we need to look at what that economic boost looks like. So we keep on talking about this three trillion dollars, but who is getting those three trillion dollars, and who is going to benefit from it? Um, it speaks about millions being, you know, lifted out of poverty, and that's a beautiful statement to make, but who are these millions of people, and how will they be lifted out of poverty? Um, collaborative structure, one of the biggest, the best things that um, Honorable Osiani spoke about is that unity. When you trade with another country, you create that unity. The AFCFTA or Agenda 2063 is a hit back to Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's, um, you know, African Unity Organization of, uh, of African Unity Union. So the whole issue around um, the AFCFTA is not just about trade, it's also about African unity. So what are the opportunities within the context of unity, not from a fluff perspective, but how does unity, um, you know, solve issues around peace and security, um, the conflict, and, and, and increasing intra-Africa trade is not just about economics, although economics is the most important part of it, but it's not just about economics. So how do we make that work for us in terms of bringing uh, uh, and uniting the African continent that was divided by colonization um, in previous uh, bygone eras? So, you know, the next great frontier we speak about is digitalization. So there are massive opportunities when it comes to digitalization and how that is going to play out. 
So these are just some of the things um, that you can look forward to in the next few minutes as we tackle what are the opportunities that the AFCFTA provides. And this is what our expert panelists are going to be discussing in the next um, a few minutes. So let me start with um, Sand because we finished with him in terms of introduction. So let me start with him uh, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what in general, so you work with research. Um, and by the way, research is one of my favorite topics because without research, um, we know nothing, right? We don't understand anything. We can't motivate anything. We can't drive anything. So research is the basis or it's the foundation of anything that, that we need to be able to do and we need to be able to tackle if we're going to do it well and if we're going to do it successfully as a continent. And the AFCFTA has had a lot of um, not negative feedback, but doubt, I would say, because is this just another project? Is this just something that the African continent is not speaking about and it's going to fall by the wayside? You know, let's start there before we dig into the into the opportunities per se. Where are you at um, in terms of the what is the research telling you, but also just from a thought leadership perspective, how true would it be that the AFCFTA would be ah, just another thing that the African people are talking about, the African Union are implementing, and will it ever see the light of day? Uh, what do you think, Sam? Okay, um, thank you very much, um, Yavin, uh, Madam Moderator, and I must commend um, um, the organizers, um, Anne, for putting this together. And I, I congratulate um, Honorable David for making time out to give us an elaborate and setting this stage for us. Let me be clear, and, um, and I think I speak for most people that are under 40 across Africa here. Um, so we are going to change Africa in our time. And AFCFT is that platform that will help us change it. People have said before now, Oh, Africa is just the other way around. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm from ECOWAS. ECOWAS has what they call ETLS. And people that negotiated this did it in the boardroom and they did take it to the streets. I'm not in government, I'm in private sector. And I run with numbers. And I say, what is the number telling me? The number says, me trading with my brother in Kenya or my sister in, Ke in Botswana is 16%. I'm saying Africa trading with itself is 16%. But Europe trading with themselves is about is far bigger than that. Asia, the same thing. So there is an issue, there is a problem. And as Honorable David has said, trade is a unifier and, and also collaborated. Is, trade is a unifier, trade brings people together. So what are we talking about? AFCFTA is not going to be like AFCFTA or any other agreement before. AFCFTA is come, is come to stay. One thing AFCFTA is going to do is going to pin our integration as Africans. And it has numerous benefits. And these numerous benefits are not just people at work. Because when we talk, I'm, as a researcher, I have asked people, what is your challenge in trading with Africa? And people say, it's information asymmetric. We don't know where to get these things from. We don't know where to get these commodities from. We don't know who is selling. We don't know how to negotiate. There are just no, so many barriers, non tariff barriers. Oh, you must have this document A, you must have this document B. AFCFT is going to abolish all that. AFCFT is going to create a bigger market and integrate Africa. It's going to permit producers to accept cheaper raw materials and intimate goods from other African countries i.e. a Ghanaian will be able to buy products from Botswana. A Botswana will be able to buy products from Namibia, Nairobi. So it's, it's bringing Africa together and it will improve the condition of our regional value chains, integrating us into the global market. And it's also, AFC is also going to give us access to import from other African countries, that is for consumers. We talked about e-commerce. Those AFCFT, as a matter of fact, I'm happy when I heard that um, EFC, I mean, uh, e-commerce negotiation has been moved forward 
to the second phase, uh, to the, um, to the, to the um, phase two or phase three negotiation, which is a fantastic thing. That means our policymakers, which we consider as policy influencers, are, are listening to policy influencers like us that say, this is the number. The number says, the young people are majority in e-commerce. They can easily use their phone to buy things. Why not negotiate things that will make it favorable for us? And that is, the, that is what EFCFTA is going to do. EFCFTA will never, and I say this with my heart, <laughs> will never be like any other agreement that has ever happened. I say, oh, Africa, don't take them serious. Let the world watch. Africa is coming, and we are ready to make it happen because we understand what EFCFTA trading with one another will do. It will create employment, not just employment in the paper. It will create currently, right as I speak now, Without that EFC, with, with that EFC, I wouldn't be inter, I wouldn't be on this platform. We'll not be having this discussion. And we have several uh, non-official non platforms that we've created. I can speak to Luis. I've not seen Luis face to face, but we have interacted as well as we interact almost every day because we believe, belong to a number of other platforms. The same with a lot of young people. So we're saying, how do we treat it ourselves? And the FCFT is giving us that voice as Africans to make this happen. And that is it. So the number is this. The number is low as, the, as we speak. But in, the prospect is there. We can see the, index, in the, in the indices showing that when we come together to talk, we, we improve our 16 percent into African trade and boost it to become even 100 percent. Because even the World Bank and every person that says, "Oh, before now, Africa cannot do this for themselves," are now coming together and say, "No, let's watch out for this, and we're going to get it right." Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Are you there? Yes, I am. I am, Sand. I'm waiting for the, the host to keep on unmuting me. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know the passion that you have around, um, and I'm going to repeat what you started out saying, just so that that becomes the essence of what we are discussing today. So thank you for starting out, kicking it off on a high note. You said we are going to change Africa in our time. And the AFCFTA is going to be the way that we do it. So let that be um, the foundation on which we build. Um, and I'm going to go to, to Laura next um, from a UNECA perspective and carrying on with the trajectory from a, a, a research and analyst perspective. And you're going to talk about it to me in terms of policy. Um, so obviously, member nations of the African Union vary in, in, in preparedness. So you know, we are, you, we've just heard Sand, um, uh, Lewis is going to come in and he's going to take what Sand has said to another level and he's just going to add to it. I, I can tell you that already. Um, Laura, every country, um, it doesn't matter the state of ratification um, or does, but the preparedness is obviously very, very different. As I sit here in South Africa, we are one of the countries that is ready to go. Um, most African countries are not necessarily ready to go. What are the, the, the challenges, the gaps, the requirements, the needs, whatever it is that we need to be able to do to get the various countries at the level of preparedness that we need to get to and what are some of those stumbling blocks that we need to get over in order for us to get to that level of preparedness? So when, um, when His Excellency Wamkele Mene says, right, he's cutting the ribbon, it's time to go, most countries are able um, to hit you know, the on button. What, where and how, what is the status of, 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 of where we are as a continent? Uh, thank you so much, Yave. I think I'll start by looking at the stumbling blocks. Uh, first of all, we have to realize that AFCFTA in itself is not a silver bullet and it cannot exist in a, in a silo. Uh, what do I mean by this? Um, uh, the same exuberance that the member states, that the AU member states have displayed in signing of the AFCFTA should, be, should also be displayed in uh, the signing and ratification of other agreements or initiatives, a case in point will be the protocol on free movement of, of persons across the continent. Uh, if we look at the 2019 figures from the AU, we find that uh, 32 countries signed the agreement on free movement of persons within the continent, but only four have ratified it. 
And uh, why am I bringing this up? It's because tourism tends to be correlated to trade. Um, a case in point, I think an um, Honorable Osiani has given an example of uh, maybe having a company in South Africa sourcing for, for raw materials from North Africa and selling the end product in uh, West Africa. But for you to be aware of certain opportunities, you need to visit the country. But what happens when you don't have the opportunity, when there are so many barriers which prevent you from moving to certain places to see what is happening? Because if we just look at the current situation, I can be in East Africa, but I'm not aware of the existing opportunities in West Africa or North Africa or Southern Africa. And uh, this is also in line with, with one of the studies that we carried out recently, which shows that if there's an increase in, in, in intra-African continent, this is likely to boost the intra-African trade. And uh, also now moving from that, and let me look at um, some of the initiatives that can be used to support the AFCFTA. Um, I think I should mention at the 2012 meeting where it was, con where it was decided um, that the AFCFTA should actually be established, the heads of states and governments actually preempted the need to have an action plan, which they call the Boosting African Initiative Action Plan. Uh, this action plan has seven pillars, and one of the pillars is around trade facilitation. Here we're talking about the one-stop border force, and it also has a cluster. It also has a cluster which looks at infrastructure. And of course, these are really critical elements when you're talking about trade. Uh, you need to have good network, you need to have good transport networks to transport the goods within the within a country and also within the continent. And of course, if we look at the various countries, the levels of development of, of infrastructural, infrastructural development varies. The same thing applies to productive capacities. But what this means is we need to invest more in infrastructure. We need to invest more in um, product in, in, in productive in our productive capacities. And now this is where collaboration comes in where we can't relegate AFCFTA to be something that is just driven by the government, because even as Honorable Otiani mentioned in his keynote, the government is more, of, is more of a facilitator. So in this particular case, we need to have the private sector coming together, working with various development partners to put in place some of the things that are needed to ensure that um, AFCFTA can actually be implemented effectively. And I think an example we can give here is trademark and what it's doing with regards um, developing of one-stop border posts across the region. Um, and uh, other than that, we can also look when it comes to productive capacity, capacities, we are looking at increased investments in our continent. And at least the good thing is under phase two, uh, one of the protocols that are to be negotiated under phase two of this agreement is uh, the protocol on investments. And why are investments important? Uh, when we have investments, uh, this is an easier pathway for the small medium companies to supply goods or raw materials to this uh, to some of the companies, and uh, this uh, and this will be a pathway for them to uh, to ultimately join the value chains. Um, because if we look at uh, just the recent, if we look at our data and also just um, anecdotal evidence, you find that most of the SMEs tend to be locked out of uh, foreign. Uh, value of a global value chains and this is because excuse me and uh, this is because uh, they tend to be relegated to standard takers but not the makers of the standards and this can we can look at the example of um tax um i i think it's tar, tax escalation the, the, where this implies that uh, the raw materials are subjected to um to less tax compared to compared to the um, to the processed goods. And this means that the African countries, um, now what they end up import, exporting more of is um, raw materials rather than processed, uh, processed goods, which is of course the opposite scenario happens when we look at the continent. But when we have companies within the continent where the, where the local firms, where the SMEs can join and uh, have that as a pathway to later on, joining the global value chain this can be an important starting point i think i'll stop here for now
Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, I just want to get to. So, Lewis, um, the AFCFTA agenda could have a, 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 a boomerang effect, right? Um, if, if, if current negotiations on, on some of the, the, the protocols that are being, being done at the moment um, becomes, you know, highly protracted. Um, sorry, so this, this, this question is for Lewis. Um, despite, you know, the propagation um, of, of the AFCFTA um, by, by people, you know, the AU leadership, um, various governments, people like us, um, there are, you know, there, as I said earlier, there are international trade experts, there's media, um, there are doubters, you know, they call them the doubting Thomases from the Bible, um, in terms of whether this would actually uh, become effective. We've got, uh, Wamkele Mene speaks about the fact that who said this was going to be easy, it is going to be difficult, we are going to have challenges, but irrespective, it needs to be done. What are those challenges in the road um, ahead before we start talking opportunities? Thank you very much, uh, Yavi. I hope I can be heard loud and clear. I, I, I think that I keep saying, I remember during one of those days when we were on the uh, private sector stakeholders uh, meetings. I remember on one of the days I was uh, traveling for an expert meeting before even the agreement became um, adopted. I was in the flight and I sat by one American diplomat. And she asked me, uh, young man, where are you going? You look like you're going for an uh, international conference. I said, yes, I'm going for, uh, we are trying to put together to see how the ASCFT will be a uh, real And she asked me one question. She said, are you sure that this thing, that they, I, remember, I want to make, make emphasis on the word, this thing, are you sure that this thing will work? Are you sure that this whole thing that is going around will work? And I said, yes. Yeah. I told her that the very fact that you see me in the airplane making that effort to go, is a confirmation that it will surely work. And she just smiled at me, and that was the last time I saw her for a long time. And today we have the ASCFT in process. One of the things that I want us to really understand is that we shouldn't put burden on the ASCFT. It's too young. It's part of the whole agenda 2063 that we all know. Even though Currently, we are calling some of the protocols. It's still not called protocols yet. We might even have problems with the heads of states because they have not accepted it yet as protocols. So we realize that we only have phase one protocols on trade, on services, and uh, disputes. So the other ones we have been mentioned currently to the heads of state are their secretariat. They will call it committees, committees, committees because it has not even gotten to the full attention of the heads of state of both phase two and phase three to yet to be called protocols. That is one of the big challenges yet. In other words, there could be the possibility that all that the African trade ministers have proposed could be either abandoned or could not even be accepted at all. Yet, you could also realize that during uh, the negotiations currently at the uh, 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 priority sectors and the trading services, uh, 43 countries have ratified those 43 countries who have ratified, some of them have not fully ratified the whole agreement yet, but under the priority set, they are going ahead to ratify. So what is keeping them from ratifying it at the bigger picture and, and submitting their letters of education to the uh, AUC? I made uh, an issue about the fact that the challenge that we are facing now is that uh, we, it is a, a process where right now we are at stage one. ASCFT or the economic integration that we are experiencing is at stage one. And at stage one, we are at the uh, free movement of goods and services level. Because what we are foreseeing is that the people, sometimes we look at the economic, uh, European Union level, which is about stage four of regional economic integration, whereby you have everything external, uh, you have one common uh, market, you have one uh, common uh, external uh, custom union, you have 
we have not reached there yet. And so you're going to be having these kind of uh, disparities among member states where even some member states go in with one tariff common lines, you have another regional economic bloc going in as one with one common tariff line, one country going. It's not a holistic uh, 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 block going like that. So you even still have some economic, some uh, member states having partnership agreements with um, other uh, other countries outside Africa because we are still at that stage. And this is my emphasis that we cannot put so much pressure on the agreement at stage one. We are trying to rip the benefit of stage four at stage one, which will not work. And that is one of the issues that um, uh, many one clearly have been trying to put across that the European Union did not start in one day. The European Union took several years even to really reach where they are. I, say, I would like to urge member states, I would like to urge private sector, I would like to urge we all that we should continue to channel the message that look, we are still in the process of moving to a certain stage of a full one African market. When we reach there, all these bottlenecks that we are seeing now will not be will be a turn of the path. That is my first thing. My last point is that at this stage, I think that uh, 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 we ourselves, the challenge is that the revenue shortfall that uh, 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 that was going to be proposed or envisaged is not what they are realized because of the pandemic. Nobody wanted the pandemic. Nobody expected the pandemic. And therefore, to just liberalize 90% like that is not just easy for some of them at all. Already, the, the, the revenue shortfall was already no diving. Then the pandemic. Then we are now looking at what has going to ratify and saying, oh, look, 90% uh, over a period of time, it's a difficult reality. It's like, where do I stand? It's a dilemma of a ghost. Do I have to go back? Do I have to go this direction? Do I have to accept it? And so that has been one of the junctions that most member states are trying to look at. How, how did I get to this point of, of letting go my revenue in that capacity? But hey, it is better of when you were already not even in this agreement because you were still having such problems. And so I would also want to say that these are some of the challenges among these trade negotiators, among these uh, negotiators who, who cannot go back to their government to explain the realities on the ground. We have to face it. No one, no one, if you put, just as we put together all the, uh, uh, the classified the countries in stages, in liberalization uh, 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 perspective, the, the category six, uh, category three, that is the group of six, who are very, very least developed. It's not going to be easy for them within the first few years of after liberalizing. And so this is one of the junctions that uh, uh, the challenges we are, we are seeing, the reality that we are facing uh, after liberalizing of 90% in the face of the pandemic, in the face of uh, no diving revenue shortfall, and where we have the opinion. Finally, so finally, one of the areas also that we're foreseeing that I think uh, uh, is becoming a bit uh, uh, trying to pull around is that, look, we did not factor security as one of the key issues in this whole agreement. And we'll have to look at it again because there is a potential threat when you have uh, countries sharing border and their borders have been closed for uh, several years, especially if you look at Algeria and Morocco. These are big players in the whole ASCFT agreement. These are big contributors of Jews when it comes to the African Union. And yet their borders have been closed for years. How do you, how does ASCFTA come in? Because ASCFTA, ASCFTA have its boundaries. How would the political uh, leaders play in this whole thing? So security is key. And we have to now go back and really look and rethink whether it's not too late to have some uh, supplementary uh, inputs. This is what I think that we need to be looking at all these things, just as we are considering the women and youth uh, in trade as one of the important uh, committee discussions we should look at uh, security because that is very, very key. And also we should embrace, we are also going to see this free movement of people very, very well. Then we should embrace the one African passport because it was supposed to be due last year. How many countries have ratified? Because when we have the one African passport, it really overshadows the Abuja Treaty of 1991 on which the ASCFT stands on, on which the really stands on for free movement of people. One African passport will be one important agenda we can continue to move simultaneously as we are traveling through these uh, uh, early stages of uh, 
of foreseeable challenges which we can surely overcome. Thank you, Yavi. Yavi, sorry. Thank you, Lewis. Um, you've covered you've covered a lot. You've covered you know the things that we foresaw, um, but also the stuff that we didn't think about, um, especially in terms of security. Um, and you touched on COVID. Um, you know, no one saw the pandemic coming. Um, I don't know how many people know this. I mean, you and I know this, um, that actually the AFCFTA was supposed to have gone live on the 1st of July last year and was delayed until the 1st of January, um, purely because, you know, COVID hit. So, um, you know, there were so many delays, but not only that, it has impacted and added um, levels or layers to our already struggling economies in Africa um, that the AFCFTA was supposed to have rescued um, and then COVID hit and made fragile broken. Um, so now we have to we have to look at it as not only as you know uh, uh, um, an answer to to economic transformation but also an answer to economic recovery. So my friend Sand, you and I are going to be great friends because uh, we speak the same language uh, um, and you don't have a choice by the way but to be my friend uh, purely because we're all fighting for the same things. Lewis will tell you. <laughs> um, you know, the AFCFTA stand is a, a landmark is a landmark agreement in the world, not just in Africa. Uh, we spoke about it earlier where I spoke about the three million three trillion dollars very loosely. But technically, according to the UNECA, uh, Laura's organization, um, you know, it, it it has the potential to create a free trade market. Um, of $3.4 trillion um, with a, com com sorry, a combined GDP of $3.4 trillion. If implemented fully, it will become the largest in the world and lift these millions of people and the number being bandied about, as we all know, is about 30 million out of poverty. But it's nice to say those things and, and policymakers and policy researchers like Laura is, um, it's great to have that those those figures and those stats and those facts at hand for us to be able to bandy about when we're having policy discussions. But let's talk implementation and, and action. And what does it mean for the many millions of women and youth that are caught up in the largest contributor to Africa's bottom line, which is the informal um, economy? So when we look at this, what, uh, what is it that needs to be done? So before we go into the actual opportunities for them, what is it that needs to be done? So I'm, aside from being Pabwa, I, I, I own a business. What would I need to know as a business that delivers trade services all across the world? What do I need to know as a business? What is the, you know, as I was saying, the dressmaker, the consultant, the graphic designer, the lawyer. What do all of these people need to know in order to be able to take advantage of the AFCFTA? So what do I need to know? Tell me what I need to know to take advantage of the AFCFTA as a small business owner in Africa. Okay, th thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Um, I, it's not that I believe, um, what a CFTA will do for the small businesses that we call, in quote, informal. Why do we call them informal? Because they've not gone through the, the process, most times the redneck, the bottleneck, this, the difficulty of getting their businesses registered and go through the process of documenting it to do trade across border. So that's why we call them informal. What they should be aware now that because they are from a country that is a state party. By the way, um, as um, Louis has rightly pointed out, Europe is still going through the process of even integrating themselves. We can see UK jumping, at British, UK jumping out of the union and we have the Brexit and now they realize, oh, we're supposed to be in. Oh, we're not supposed to be in. 
we are coming together. Africa is one and has been fragmented over the years. And we have so many factors fighting against us. What the small business owner or the women that moves, maybe their textile from Nigeria to Benin Republic have to realize now that they don't need to go through a back door or settle anybody or to go, go to any corruption. They don't have free access because of AFCFT, even while the documentation is still ongoing, the processes of ensuring this works is still ongoing. Countries, what countries need to do now is to start ensuring that the national reform align with the regional reform and continental reform, continental framework. So you can't do any reform anymore. It's not allowed because if, it's, if you do it, you're going to be going against your obligation in the agreement that you signed. Your agreement, the, any, any agreement, any, any reform you, you will be carrying out as a country has to align with the region and the continental framework. What do I mean by that? I mean that the small businesses should realize that they are, and they must advocate for that, that their country's reform must align with the regional and continental reform. That makes them able to trade. So as, as, a, as a consultant um, that wants to trade with, that wants to offer his services to a, an Angola company, he knows that now that I need just one documentation to make this happen. So it saves cost and as well as makes it easier. And I agree with this issue. We can't have an AFCFT without having the framework on free movement of person. The, even the, the agreement said free movement of business persons. I think they should take away that business because a tourist can decide to just to travel, not being a business person. So we should also we have to couch that word free movement of business. It has to be in a way whereby a, a, an average person, and that's why this continental passport is important. We talk about security, 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 security issue is everywhere. That was not stop. As a matter of fact, security issue between China and America, but that has not um, um, hindered trade. Let's focus on what brings us together. What brings us together is that trade. If a, a, a small business owner knows that I can do business with a Kenya business owner, without cumbersome, without um, a complex issue, which is not going to be complex, then they go ahead and do it because the FCFC is giving them that platform. If a tech company can collaborate with um, a Nigerian co tech company because of this is it. Let them do it. Let them just start doing it. But we know it's a process. Now, what they need to, what we need to do as people is advocacy. We must educate them. We can. It, it's not supposed to just be a one-off education. It's a continuous process. We speak about it. We speak about it. We speak about it by speaking about it and discussing it. We are iron out some. Some, uh, some challenges of understanding, and we've put things straight. We, I think, uh, I, I appreciate that even the FCFTA agreement recognize advocacy and liaising with um, uh, private sector, because businesses don't do, uh, government don't do business, it's private business, that, um, um, private sector that does business. So they, we must, and government must speak to us before they go into any agreement. And the agreement must ensure that it doesn't have national coloration. It must have a regional and continental coloration. By so doing, we'll be able to overcome a lot of obstacles we are talking about. We have already 38 countries ratified and certified that um, ratified and deposited agreement. That is a good thing already. So if others are not doing it, they will join us when they start seeing the good the goodness that comes out of it. And by the way, the big the big um, 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 economy in Africa already done it. So even when small countries, small countries and vulnerable states lament that AFC, I mean, COVID-19 has disrupted the economy. AFCFTA is that, pro, that, that, that policy, that platform they need, that will, how am I going to put it, that will help them out of these challenges of COVID-19 is the palliative they need. Yes, yes, it's the they need. So they, they, they have to key into it. Because remember, we're Africans, and Africans look out for one another. We are our brothers keepers, and we must reflect that. And it has always been who we are. We are not violent people. We are not aggressive people. We are people that love to ensure that our community is better. So that is what we are bringing to the AFCFT. Those small island countries or small or, or, or lock, uh, landlocked countries should realize that no country in Africa will want to take advantage of them. Currently, who are they trading with? All these things will be trading on commodity. What has it done for us? Why, why are we still a poverty capital of the world? Because we're not trading ourselves. 
when we start training ourselves, you see that poverty will go. Riches will come because we know how not to abuse ourselves. We know how to take care of ourselves. So those countries that have not that are scared of coming on board because they feel they will lose out of the tariff they are getting, they should come to the team and say, look at us, we are small. What are you going to give to us? And I know definitely our big brothers, South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, we look at them and say, yes, we can't take this. We'll exclusively allow you to do this. And by the way, the 30% 30, 30 liberalization is a process. The vulnerable states have about 10 years. The Nigerians, the Kenyans, the South Africa have five years. So what are we scared of? Why are we scared of opening up and doing business with our brothers and sisters? I think let's come on and do this, make this happen. Let's forget about the, all the negativity people are talking, tell, you know, sorry, people are talking, telling, um, talking about us, giving us negative names that we can't do this, make this happen. Let's tell them that we know who we are. We're Africans, we are brothers keepers, and AFCS will work and business will be happy for it. Innovation will come, industrialization will come in Africa through AFCFTA. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. My brother, you speak, you preach. <laughs> uh, but that's exactly it. This is, this is ours. The AFCFTA is for us. We never need to apologize for it. We never need to apologize to benefit from it. It was created for Africa's 1.3 billion people. That's you, me, and everyone else. This is not only for the, the multinational big organizations. They are going to take advantage of it, obviously, because they are here. They're going to drive the economy. But if small business does not step up and look for information and find information, attend webinars like this, and be able to understand how they can form part of those millions of people um, that are going to be part of that 3.5, the GDP of $3.4 trillion dollars, because every single one of us have the opportunity to do that. We never need to apologize for the AFCFTA. We never need to apologize for anything with regard to benefiting from it and making our lives better and for our brothers and sisters from, from a continental perspective. Never, ever, ever. But by the same token, we need to rally behind the AFCFTA. We need to support it. We need to find information that drives, that helps us drive and helps each other to be able to understand. So I hear you, I am I'm your follower, I am there, I am there to support you whenever you need um, somebody to, to, to create a loud hailer for any of the information. This is, my husband says that I have a built-in um, amplifier. So um, you can see I was made for this, <laughs> to be able to scream from the rooftop about what needs to happen in our economic environment to drive the AFCFTA. And we need, to, it's not a silver bullet. And Laura, I come back to you. So I'm coming to you now in terms of, yes, 100%. It is not going to solve all of our problems. However, it is Africa's last chance at economic recovery, economic development, and Agenda 2063 self-sustainability. But let's get real. What? Um, let's be. Let's also be really honest. And and I like to say the AFCFTA. I am not going to see the success, the true success of the AFCFTA in my lifetime. We are doing this now, almost for the next generation. We will only see the beginnings of it. Every country will be different. I want to get your view on. Operationalization was meant to, so it became effective 1 January 2021, but operationalization hasn't begun. Um, and that is planned for early next year. Plan. Um, we hope it's going to, to take effect and the operationalization comes into effect. What and where are we with regard to the negotiations and that operationalization and implementation and my last question with regard to that, so it's the same, it's the same question, but what are our companies, business people, Africans supposed to be holding their governments accountable for in terms of knowing around knowing the stuff that's happening around implementation of the AFCFTA? So I'm a business owner 
what should I be asking of the South African government to share with me um, so that I am ready as a business in terms of implementation of the AFTSA and when it does um, operationalize. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Yavi. Uh, but before I delve into your question, allow me to very briefly respond to a point that was made by Louis on the revenue shortfall. From uh, the analysis that we have been doing uh, in the recent past, it is clear that when it comes to the revenue loss, uh, it is not heterogeneous. It is heterogeneous across the various countries. But one thing that it is, that is clear is for most of the countries, the loss of tariff revenue is actually just a drop in the ocean. And this is because uh, most of the African countries currently trade within their regional blocks. Uh, so this means when even uh, it means that at, for now, they are not really, um, they, uh, it, um, um, okay, allow me to retrace my thoughts. Also, uh, this just means that ultimately, when they start trading, when they'll be trading under the AFCFTA uh, auspices, they won't lose a lot of revenue compared to what they're getting now, just by virtue of where the trade takes place. And for the few countries which will experience a lot of revenue loss, there are mechanisms that are being put in place to support them. Um, so then, uh, and I think the last point still under the revenue shortfall is we also have to understand that in as much as there might be some losses from the tariff revenue side, but there's also much that can be gained, especially from the excise duty side and VAT, especially considering that um, most of the countries will now be moving towards more, more uh, will, move, will move towards manufacturing goods compared to uh, just exporting the raw materials. Um, and now allow me to uh, now move to the questions you have asked. When it comes to operationalization, a trade under the FCFTA actually started, was supposed to start on 1st um, January 2021. But four days after that, now that is on 5th January 2021, two Ghanaian companies actually became the pioneers of exporting under the FCFTA. Uh, there's a company which exported products to Guinea, and there's another country which uh, uh, still a, a company in Ghana, in Ghana which exported products to Guinea. Um, uh, but allow me to also just answer the question more broadly and say that I think all the countries are the state parties which have ratified and deposited their instruments are eligible to trade under the AFCFTA. Um, but what needs to be done and what the business people need to be asking for, uh, first of all, will be they need to be aware of the goods which are covered under the 90 percent tariff liberalization because as we are aware this is not going to be a full liberalization there is 10 percent which is going to comprise of goods which will be excluded and these are mostly the sensitive products so as a business person you need to be aware of um are the goods that i'm trading in eligible for um the tariff the tariff liberalization under the AFCFTA? Uh, then secondly, it will be critical to know issues around the rules of origin. And here we are basically talking about what comprises a made in Africa product, uh, because we are aware that most of the countries uh, source some raw materials from outside the continent. But, it, uh, but the main question here is, to what percentage can you incorporate some of these materials sourced from other countries while manufacturing your end product and the, for the products to still be considered made in Africa. And uh, this is really critical uh, because I think in, in some quarters we hear rules of origin actually being referred to as the passport when it comes to trading under the AFCFTA. And uh, lastly, it will be really important to have information around the sanitary and phytosanitary standards. You need to be aware of what is the quality which is required for the goods in which I'm trading in, such that finally when the goods reach their destination, they don't get uh, rejected because of various quality standards. Um, uh, I think I will stop here for now and thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so, so much. Um, Stan, 
I'm going to come back to oh, Louis, sorry, Louis. I'm going to and and the next uh, the next question is for all three of you. What are the opportunities for anyone in Africa um, that the AFCFTA provides? So let's answer the question. And how can it be accessed, Louis? Good. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, my co-panelists have built a big one to that. But I think that um, by and large, the opportunities are enormous. What we need to do for businesses to benefit, because already we were doing business before ESCFT came. How were we doing it? We just need to really uh, take advantage of it this way. One, we need to really um, translate all the literature in a more practical guideline book. We need to have a practical guideline book on all the agreements and its annexes. For example, we need to have a practical book on trading services to help businesses who would like to pitch, whether within the tourism, whether within the five priority areas, all the uh, yet to be accepted or yet to be adopted seven other priority areas, including energy. It's very important because it will help professional bodies that has that is part of the first five priority areas, sectors. If there is a practical guideline book, and I know that the Secretariat is working on, it's about to work on this. We as uh, think tanks, individual private sector can also come out with practical guideline books. This will help what I call the, the rural or the informal ASCFTA within national territories. Because if you go to every country, there is a need for a decentralization. And this is key for those in the informal sector, as, as a lot of them who are pitched around the rural areas to really be participatory in this. Secondly, there is a need for the um, local after offices that were proposed by the Council of African Trade Ministers to be implemented. Most of the member states have not really put a lot of action to this recommendation. Ghana, we have the after local coordination of that act as an intermediary between uh, interministerial committee and then the after secretariat. And the purpose is for them to continue with sensitization, capacity building, because there is a need to let various stakeholders put themselves together in cooperative unions, association, trade associations, where they can be able to. But again, to be able to go in as one block to seek whether it's going to be uh, technical assistance or going to be trade finance support. That is very, very key because we have a lot of our people in the informal sector already trading, we're already doing cross border trade. Let them, how do we bring them into the exportable chain? Some can be within the supply chain, some can be within the procurement chain, so that we can put them together. I like one concept that Egypt is doing. You know, when it comes to, uh, in terms of uh, the area of professionals, they are trying to rope in the, and the, the uh, newly graduated uh, uh, graduates to go around uh, the export associations, help uh, to help most of these uh, informal sector people to take advantage of not only SCFD, but exporting outside Egypt. This will let the people really come closer because some of them have a problem with identification of products. Some of them don't understand which product do I have to take to which country. I remember recently a business, uh, a Mongo called me, a woman, and said, look, I'm trying to import something from a so-and-so country. I'd like to know how do I go about it? Is it a product that people don't know? We're only looking at the export. We're looking at the import as well. Because if a product is being produced in Togo and its originating status is in Togo, and it falls part of those tariff lines, if I tell that business woman that when you import to Ghana, you don't have to pay duty, she will be happy. That means that her volume of import will be high and it will be revenue, uh, it, will serve, it will bring revenue to Togo. It's also going to help the Ghana market because the prices will fall because you're not going to pay tax on export. We need to bring, make it practical to these people, put them together, bring them together in associations so that they can be able to tap into the practical gain of it. This is one of the areas that the local coordination offices should really be doing. Then again, my appeal to the media. The media should know that they are not just uh, transporters or 
uh, the pipeline of ASUT. They are part of it. They are part of it. And therefore, they should offer, they should come up with programs free of charge to uh, uh, think tanks, to institutions, to private sector people who like to do air programs on their platforms to, to, to the masses who don't understand, to have a collaboration. That is the best way. And I think Kenya is doing very well when it comes to this rural uh, trade information. This is some of the practical ways that businesses can do. Then again, I heard that the insurance community did not know whether they really fit into this whole ASCFT. No, professional bodies, come on. You are part of the financial institutions. You are part of the professional bodies, especially insurance. And I, I keep saying that if you don't see any form of it in the agreement, look, you contact your trade negotiators, contact your policy makers within your regional economic blocks to push forward an agenda to put, push forward a lobby, which can be discussed at the uh, 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 trade minister's councils. And then finally, you will see it being implemented. Let us know that just as we have the exit clause or the ESCFT after five years, we still have opening windows where we can do a lot of review, a lot of inclusions. So this is my appeal and how businesses can position themselves to really benefit from the uh, uh, numerous uh, 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 opportunity that ESCFT uh, really brings. Then again, I would like to also say that which they, 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 uh, before even the digitization of trade or the digitized uh, trade, which is going to be part of the uh, protocol in the end, before it comes, people are already doing e-commerce. People are even doing, and, and when it comes to e-commerce, we are looking at the bigger picture. Let us start with our mobile phones. Let us start with our mobile phones. And I'm happy that a lot of people are really making it, doing business uh, 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 digitally. And it's amazing. This is one of the areas we have to look at. This is what we have to encourage even the youth. Then again, we need to support, we need to support those, our youth who come out with inventions, who come out with innovations, when, uh, and help them with copyrights, help them with patents. Even though the logic of copyright is not completed yet, we still can help them. When they come out with uh, 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 an innovative product, how do we help them from the process to the point where the product will reach the consumer market? And that's one of the things that my network is doing. When we hear that you have come out with a product, we'll help you get you registered with the uh, regi uh, business registration authorities. After that, we have to get certification and standardization. Then after that, we have to look for market intelligence for you. We need to bridge the gap between conceptualization of ideas and products to the final uh, end destination of where consumers will do. This is what will let all of us be more inclusive in reaping the benefits of the African continental free trade. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you so much. So this is what I wanted um, when I started off the session, when I said policy is one thing, um, having the AFCFTA is one thing, but unless it's meaningful and significant and puts money into the hands of the people of Africa, it's going to be meaningless. So, um, Laura, I know that you are policy, but when you look at it from a policy perspective, I want you to make it um, as practical as you possibly can. So I'm gonna ask you the same question. What are the opportunities that the AFCFTA provides and how can Africans access it? Uh. Uh, thank you, Yavi. And uh, Louis has given a really comprehensive and practical answer to this question. Uh, but I'll just mention three things. One uh, is around the um, industrialization. Um, uh, we know most of the trade that happens within Africa is of manufactured goods compared to extra African trade, which tends to be export of um, commodities and processed commodities. So this basically means there's an opportunity that African businesses can take up uh, trade within the continent more uh, and take advantage of um, just trading and trading um, uh, trading or uh, trading in manufactured in manufactured goods and that uh, this will actually be really key in supporting industrialization and uh, subsequently structural transformation which will be key in ensuring that the populace has a decent standard of living, a decent standard of living. Uh, but other than that, I think we are all aware that trade is not gender neutral. Uh, in most cases, women tend to be left behind when it comes to uh, the implementation of trade agreements and trade policies. So in this regard, uh, it is key for 
uh, not just the business associations working together with think tanks. Um, case in point is currently UNECA is involved in a lot of training activities on opportunities that businesses and especially women can harness under the AFCFTA. And that this is something that needs to be done and taken up by more organizations. Um, uh, and also at the policy level, uh, just ensuring that uh, women, the policies cater for the women, ensuring that um, they're not, ensuring that if the policies are being made, the women are not left behind or rather they are not um, unfair to the women. Um, and lastly, I think I'll talk about the green transition. Of course, you know now we are, I think, moving towards the end of COP26. And uh, even I, I think also now, as you are uh, thinking about our recovery strategies from COVID-19, we are talking about building back better and greener. Uh, so as you are thinking about the opportunities that can be harnessed under the AFCFTA, we also need to think about uh, the green transition. Uh, thinking about setting up more opportunities in uh, the green economy, and actually this will end up being beneficial to our economies uh, because what we are finding from our preliminary studies is that actually more jobs are created when we have investments in uh, the green economy compared to uh, compared to let's say um, investments in uh, um, in in the traditional investments which make which take up traditional fossils. Um, and I think I think I'll just uh, end by emphasizing on what we are currently doing. Trade uh, we, are, we are currently carrying out a number of training activities, and uh, I think um, uh, maybe I can I will share information later on on when we intend to carry their trainings in uh, the various regions, so that uh, some of the participants here can take advantage and learn more from what we'll be sharing with the rest of the people. I think that's it from my side, over to you. Thank you, Laura. My brother Sand, what are the opportunities that exist or that the AFCFTA provides and how can it be accessed? Okay, Practical thank you as possible, yeah. please, my brother. Okay, so, um, so thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Um, so practical as possible. So um, what we should be doing now is, um, is businesses looking out for partnership across Africa. You know, before now, you, you see businesses looking out for opportunity. Oh, I, want to be, I want my partner to come from Europe. Now look out for your partner in, 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 in Kenya. Look out for partner, look out partner that will be able to create collaboration. That is one particular cross-border partnership we should be looking at. Because without that, you might not necessarily have to travel down to these countries to do things yourself. So the practical thing, you look out for them and you create that collaboration, you create that framework, create that agreement and start trading. Don't wait for everything to be done before you start trading. Secondly, most of us, you know, Nigerians, we lack education. So we travel most times outside Africa for our education. We should, because of trade, because and we've not talked about it a lot here, trade in services. It's most times, um, even when Louis mentioned insurance, yeah, that is a trade in services. So more of that should happen. So cross-border education. So the practical thing, I look out for university in Kenya. Kenya should look out for university in Nigeria and come because when you do this, you are having that soft power. You understand how the people think and how they do their things. So. Collaboration starts from school. I have my friends at school in the UK, so I have friends that are from all over the world that we are still collaborating in a number of ways. So I need something in Bahrain, I just call my friend up. Let's do that, let's start that. So we also have to also start this certification harmonization. Cross-border certificate and harmonization has to start. We don't need to wait until all the agreement lines are dotted. Since we know we have this thing already, let's start that collaboration. We should also start the organ, and, and that is why I have to commend Anna as well for putting this together. Because what this has done is to also ensure that I can speak to someone and some other African country can. So we need more of these conferences to start happening and exhibitions. So you know what is happening in one country or the other. So we also need, we also need, this is very important, trade support organizations to start working. For example, 
I will be reaching out to uh, my, my fellow moderator for us to do maybe a market analysis between Kenya and Nigeria on a particular, a particular commodity or product line. So that information are there. So they always say information, when you look for information in Africa, you don't get it. But we will get it this time around because when we start working together across borders, not looking at our differences, but looking at what will benefit us in a win-win situation, then we'll get it right. So cross borders, chambers of commerce, Abuja Chamber of Commerce, Lamin, uh, Nairobi Chamber has to start speaking to themselves. So that brings the, because they already have a platform of where members are already um, there. They, can, they provide their members. They know who their members is. So they can then start doing business across border. These are practical and simple ways to go about it. What will it take? And we don't even have enough African originated e-commerce platform. And one interesting thing about this is that the PASA has is even on board. It intro, uh, the uh, Import and Export Bank has created, given us a platform where the convergence will start coming in. And Africa is also going, there's a lot more things going on in Africa that is fantastic that we can leverage on. We're also going to the digital currency part of things where you don't need this. Um, I have, I have um, um, uh, Chile, I have um, 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 Egyptian pounds, Naira. They will be all gone. So we have collaboration, cross-border collaboration one. Let's start going to our schools too. Let's start unifying and harmonizing our certification three. Let the chambers of business support organizations start collaborating for let's business support, which is like ours, like a think tank. Let's start collaborating, doing research together, holding conference together, having um, dialogue together. Then Africa will be better off for it. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Okay. We have two minutes left in total. So my fellow uh, panelists, you have 30 seconds uh, for your closing statement. And I want you to answer the question as follows. Um, the AFCFTA, as we all know, is the flagship project of um, the first 10-year implementation plan 2014 to 2023 of Africa's blueprint, blueprint Agenda 2063. For the Africa we want, my panelists today, as we close off, and as you say your parting in your parting shots, and 30 seconds only, what do Africans really want? Lewis. Uh, thank you. In 30 seconds, what Africans want is that when you are not happy with the chapters of a book, you don't burn the book. You can re revise editions. If these Africans are now rethinking, Africans are now rebranded, Africans are ready for industrialization, we want our leaders not to come back and tell us that this agreement it's not working, it won't work. What you need to do is that Africans are prepared to hear that you have revised what is not working so that we can move forward. This is where we are now. Thank you. Laura, 30 seconds. What do Africans really want? Uh, so I think Africans want a continent where no one is left behind and trade under the AFCFTA is one of the ways this can be achieved. Thank you. My brother Sand, I told you, you and I are gonna be best friends. <laughs> <laughs> what do Africans really want in the Africa we want? What Africa want is industrialization. What Africa want is not to be tagged as the poverty people, capital of the world. What Africa want is to have the better things of life. What Africa want is good health, sound education, be able to do business. What Africa want is to take that destiny and define their own narrative for the good of all. Africa want a collective prosperity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to the panelists. Um, and as, we, as I bid you farewell, um, the Africa we want is inclusivity and collective prosperity, as um, Sand has just said. And I'm going to end by 
telling you again who the panelists were today. So we were joined by the executive director of the AFCFTA Policy Network, Louis Yo Laura Naliaka from the, from the UNECA, and San uh, Mbakula, executive director of the Africa International Trade, Commerce and Research. And I was very privileged uh, today to be able to host all three of you. Thank you for the engagement. Thank you for the information and the insights. It has been a thrill. Um, I'm Yavi Badere. I'm the executive director of Pabwa. And please don't go anywhere. Um, there's an entire one and a half days, one and three quarter days still left. Um, thank you so much to Anne and Regal Africa Group and all of the, the partners. And with that, I head back to Anne.